Yes, why did I doubt myself? Why? Behind me is a wall of legends, people who inspired me more than anyone else on the planet. And I just got the opportunity to interview one of them and it was an absolute dream come true. So you're about to see the interview in just a sec. But just for some context, I used to race triathlon. I used to race professionally in triathlon. It was my life. And at the time when I was really, really into it, there was a world champion and his name was Craig Alexander. And I always wanted to race and win like him. I mean, everybody in the world wanted to race and win like Craig. And I just got back from Hawaii a couple weeks ago where I met Craig. And when I met him, my heart rate was like 160 beats a minute. It was pounding like crazy. And I was chatting with him and I told him how much he inspired me. And at the end, I asked him if he offered coaching and if I could get some coaching from him on a Zoom call. And he said, oh, mate, don't worry about paying me for a Zoom call. Let's just hop on a Zoom call and, and chat. And so... I was gonna initially just have a private Zoom call with him, but I felt like I know I didn't want to like you know, waste his time or anything without paying him, and I wanted to like get the most out of the Zoom call. And so I thought, why would I just have a private Zoom call with him when I could record a Zoom call with him and, and create like an interview out of it? So that's what I did. I created an interview. In the interview, we relive his glory days, so to speak, uh, as he became the world champion, and then how he defended his world championship title. And then how he got his world champion title taken away from him by someone else. And then how he came back and took it back again whilst setting a course record. And it's just a really, really cool recount of, of what happened during that four-year period. And even if you're not into triathlon, even if you're not into racing, you can still get a lot out of this interview just by observing the way a world champion thinks and sees the world and is able to, to recount what happened on race day. So uh, go ahead and enjoy the interview with Craig Crowey. Alexander. Did you dye your hair frosted tips or is that natural? Unfortunately, mate, that's natural. I wish it was jet black like it used to be. It, it looks like you uh, put the frosted tips in there, man. It looks good. No, I'm just get, getting older, unfortunately. Well, you're not You're not balding. Yeah, that's good news. I'll take any small victory at this stage. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to this interview with Craig Alexander, former Ironman world champion, a three-time Kona Ironman world champion. Are you still racing professionally or have you officially retired? You never officially retire from life. But in terms of pro triathlon racing, I haven't done one since before the pandemic. Who knows? I might jump into to something, and it, but it'll be for fun and, and fundraising more than competitive. How old are you now? I'm 50 in seven months. You're 50? Wow, yeah. dude. So, so for those who don't know, I, I used to watch Craig growing up. Uh, when I first got into triathlon, it was 2008. You might remember that year pretty well hey <laughs> yeah it was a good year good year for me yeah 2008 that was the first year you became uh, Ironman world champion right yeah it was yeah it was my my second race in Kona I, I finished second the year before and then yeah, in 08 I, I was able to go back and take the title so it was a good year yeah so 08 you took the title I remember watching that I was at my grandma's house Thanksgiving on her television and I saw you run and I was like wow I want to run like that guy I want to be able to win races like that guy and that was, um, I was like 18 years old and I had never even done a triathlon before, but just watching the way you ran, I was like, and just the strength that you had and the way you, the way you won the race, I was like, oh man, it's so inspiring. And then I glued in to next year, the 20, 2009 to see if you could, uh, win it again. And, and you did, you came back and you won it again, the second year in a row. How did it feel the first time you crossed the line, grabbed the ribbon, brought it above your head versus 2009? How did, how did that feel? You had slightly different feelings. 08 was um, satisfying and because uh, you're, you're sort of fulfilling a dream and something that you visualized and thought about and dreamt about. I actually saw the race in Hawaii, I think in the late 80s on TV, but I didn't start doing triathlon until the mid 90s and I didn't get to Kona until 2007. So it was an idea that I'd had in my head almost for 20 years that I just wanted to, to go there and race, let alone win it. I mean, who, who knew that that could be a possibility? 08 was, it was almost surreal. I, you're sort of living out a dream that you've had and visualized. And um, weirdly, it feels very similar to your dream when you're actually doing it. 08 was a really great performance physically. And I got to the lead at mile 15. I got a three and a half minute lead. And I actually had a lot more in the tank that year. But it was one of those years where I just felt so in control. I didn't feel the need to um, – it was – of all the years I raced in Kona, 08 was probably the windiest year as well. So it was never a year for breaking records. It was more a year for just uh, trying to win the race. 
I took the lead at mile 15. I think by mile 20, I had three and a half minute lead. So I just enjoyed the last six miles. Was getting regular time splits and just felt completely in control. 09, there was a bit more pressure because from the minute I won in 08, I was in the press conference immediately after the race. You go to doping control in the press conference. All people were asking me was, do you think you can defend? Um, Only three men have defended in the history of the race. It's harder to do. So straight away, there was the expectation it was going to be harder. You're now the marked man, the the one that everyone's looking to. That's a different dynamic in the race as well. A lot more demands on your time, more media, uh, more sponsorship, which is a good thing, but that comes with responsibilities. So that that brings its challenges as well. And I think I just felt a pressure that I, I wanted to do it. I thought, well, if, not, if it's very hard to do, then I want to do it. I want to be one of the guys who can do it. But I certainly did overstep the mark with the training. I felt so much um, motivation wanting to do it, not pressure. But I really wanted, like in your career, there's some things you want to do and there's some things you really want to do. And I really wanted to defend the title because nobody else had done it. I think it it had been 10 years um, since someone had done it. It might have been Tim DeBoom was the last one to do it on the men's side. And before that, it had been Dave and Mark in the 80s and 90s. So certainly wasn't something that was done very often. Yeah, I just got it in my mind that I wanted to do it. But with that, I, I just... I made a few mistakes in training. I felt I had to replicate everything from the year before to the exact nth degree, which is not always the case. Um, You know, there's a flexibility and a fluidity in training. You know, one of the best pieces of of advice I got from a a very good friend who's also a tri coach was that, you know, no two years are the same as the following year, you're a year older, your body's a little different. There's more demands on your time. I also became a, a dad for the second time in 09. So we had two, two little kids at home. Um, so that that throws different things into the mix in terms of sleep and time uh, management. So yeah, no two years are the same, but I just tried to replicate everything. And I overtrained a little bit in 09 and I had a great swim. I was one of the, one of the first out of the water in 09. We had a little group away. Andy Potts was leading the charge out of the water that year. And then we got caught at 140K on the bike by a big group that Norman Stadler dragged the big group up to us which had uh, McCormack in it and a few others. But I felt I was in a good position, notwithstanding that Lieto was 12 minutes up the road. Considering there's no there's no drafting, how does someone like Norman or Sebastian Keenley or whatever, how does a Uber biker like that pull a big pack if there is no drafting? Well, there's not meant to be drafting. And when I first went to Kona, you know, seven, it was a seven meter draft zone and there was drafting. It was ridiculous because that was a very calm year. So in Kona, when there's wind, there's often not drafting, usually not drafting because the prevailing wind is from the sides. They're cross headwinds or cross tailwinds. So at 12 or 15 metres, you get hit by the wind and you're doing your own work. Is it more just like a mental lock-in? Like they lock in the guy in front, they don't let him go? Absolutely. That plays a big part. I think mentally when you're in a group and you have a visual on someone, you can lock in on them. But there's also drafting as well. I mean, the draft marshals can't be everywhere. And there were always guys you knew when there were no draft marshals there, they would come right into the draft zone. Yeah. This year when I was at Kona, I was watching on the sidelines and I was like, wait, those guys are for sure drafting. They're like, yeah, it's like Olympic yeah. distance, distance apart. hundred percent. Yeah. And that happens. I mean, often it happens unintentionally too. When you're going over rollers, yeah. if you're on the back of the group and not concentrating, as you crest the hill, the people in the front of the group are already going down the hill. So you're coming up and cresting it. They're now accelerating down the hill. So the gap opens up. Yeah. And then conversely, when you start, when you get to the bottom and start coming up, they're already going up. So the gap yeah. closes. So there's this concertina. You have to pay very careful attention the first 35 miles of the bike in Kona because, yeah, you get this concertina. And I, I want to say a lot of the guys and girls at the top, there's a there's an integrity and an etiquette that most people don't want to draft. Oh. Um and I know for me personally, especially when I went into that race as one of the favorites, you have the cameras on you and everyone's watching. You don't want to, you don't want to be in the draft zone. You don't want people watching saying, well, that guy's clearly drafting. I, I never wanted that. So when it was a 12 meter draft zone, I would always stay 15 or 16 meters. Did you count? Did you have a count like one, two, three? Yeah. Yeah. And you get a visual as well. You, uh, you get, you get used to, you know, you know what the draft zone is and, and I would leave it a little longer for two reasons. A, I wanted my fellow competitors to know that I was doing the right thing. And secondly, because of that concert tenor, it gives you a little more margin for you're not just coming into the zone unintentionally. 
Yeah. But there were always guys who did the wrong thing. And I think you see that in sport and in life and you knew who the people were who would push the envelope and the path of least resistance and, and that whatever, you know, and when you would mention it to them or they would say it's professionalism, you know, it's only drafting if you get caught and, and that's fine if, if, if people have that mindset. In sport, you can only control yourself and the way you want to. For me, it wasn't just about winning. It was about challenging myself and doing it the way I wanted to do it. Winning as a professional athlete is one of your objectives, but the main objective is getting the most out of yourself. That that's for me, that's the that was always the goal and the challenge. So you can't control what others do. Oh nine was more a mental performance. I, I had overtrained a little bit going in. I didn't have as fresh a legs, but there were different challenges. It was a very hot year. I've never seen so many people walking in a marathon as I saw that year. I just really wanted to defend the title and I had a high motivation. So I had a much higher pain tolerance and I was just willing to push through. It wasn't a, pr a pretty performance like the year before and clinical and, and where I'd, I'd executed very well. I think I'd made some mistakes in the last few weeks leading up to the race. Probably went in a little overcooked or overdone, as they say. Um, Who led off the bike in 09? <clears throat> Chris Lieto. Oh nine, I was in a great position because I was in a little group that got off the bike towards the front of the race, what I would call the lead group, but Lieto was 12 minutes up the road. Yeah. And I'd raced him a couple of times that year. So we'd had a, we had a good little rivalry in 09. So I was well aware of his strengths and my strengths and how we sort of used to, what the dynamic was when we raced him. I got off the bike in 09 with Andreas Raylert, Rasmus Henning, Andy Potts, a lot of the big contenders, Dirk Bockel, Faris Al Sultan, Aniko Larnos, Chris McCormack, that was considered. They were considered the the contender side. So, so you crossed the line in 08, uh, and the dream comes true. And then, well, when you cross the line in 09, how does that feeling differ? Like, what's that feeling like when you cross it in 09? That was more um, an anger at myself when I crossed the line that I doubted myself. I, I, I was mad that I doubted myself or not all year, but in different parts of the year in 09, I almost, you know, when you win something big once you think, wow, that's amazing. Can I do it again? That's the real challenge now. Um, Cause sometimes you fly under the radar or you see in sports all the time, someone flies under the radar and then pops up and wins. And, you know, I kind of felt, was that me? Did I fly under the radar? Am I able to do it again? Because mm. um, I, I think every athlete wants to validate what they're doing. And, um, you know, I started doubting myself a lot. And I was getting a lot of, a little bit of criticism, not a lot, but from different areas. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I, I did just sort of um, win by accident. So when I crossed the line, I was very pumped because I, and I was, I'm not mad at myself, but I was always like, what, why did I doubt myself? Like, you know, so it was more of validation. The first time was, was fulfilling a dream. And then the second time was, yes, I can do this. I do belong here. You know, why do I have these doubts? And I think I battled those doubts intermittently my whole career because I came into the sport late, you know, as a 20, 21 year old. And I think, as you know, you know, when you grow up playing sports, like for me, it was soccer. And, and if you're good at sports, you have your parents telling you you're good. You have your coaches telling you. You have your teammates, parents, and your teammates telling you you're good. And as you're developing physically and also emotionally and mentally as a teenager, you sort of get this confidence. People are telling you you're good. So, yeah, I must be good. You know, I mean, and then you see it as well. And in triathlon, I didn't have that. I started as a 20 or 21-year-old. So I didn't have that sort of natural confidence that I think you develop as a developing human being, as, not only as a developing athlete, but as a developing person. So, yeah, I was always wondering in triathlon, am I good enough? You know, and when I would win something, if I would get criticized, I'd think, oh, maybe I'm not that good. Or so 09 was more, yes, why did I doubt myself? Why? I I do belong here. So yeah, different different feelings, different emotions. Was is is that the is that the picture you signed for me where you're flexing and you're like Yeah. You're yeah. Like anger? That's oh that was 09, yeah. And that that, and, that was like some anger coming up a little bit? You know, at some point, you just have to believe that you belong somewhere right. in life. I kind of, I, I guess it was a bit of anger, but it was a frustration. Like, why did, why did I torment myself and those around me for the last six months when I should have just been calm? And because normally that was my MO, just prepare and go in and do your best. 
And that's what I say to my kids now. My daughter at the moment is doing her final high school exams. And the last thing, I, she had an exam yesterday. And the last thing I said to her when I spoke to her before was just, you've prepared well, just do your best. You know, and it's hard sometimes because when things mean a lot to us, you know, we bubble up inside all these emotions. And, and you know, generally I was able to control that and just have fun out there and do my best in races. And even when you're a pro athlete, I, I felt I was still able to do that. And that's what I say to my kids, just do your best. But in 09, I sort of got away from that a little bit and there was more pressure, I guess. Yeah. So I was kind of like, yeah, it was it was not an anger, but it was like, I do belong here. At what point am I going to allow myself to enjoy this and just just go along for the ride and not listen to what other people are saying or get really upset when you get criticised or um, – you know, it was interesting because during my career and, and you know, you, you saw in Kona this year, my, my coaching business is called Sans Ego or Sans Ego. And Sans in French means without, without ego. And my manager came up with that name because he said, you know, throughout my career, he said it was amazing how I could go to people like a Dave Scott or a Greg Welsh or a McKeeley or any coach. And, and bring them in and say, well, tell me what I'm doing wrong. And, and I could be, I didn't mind getting critiqued as such, you know, it was, I could park the ego out of it. And I didn't mind them saying, well, like Dave Scott, our first meeting, he was like, you're very weak. You need to work on your strength, your functional strength. I thought, oh, cool. That's something to work on. How did he know? I always, that? we got in the gym one day and he put me through a whole range of exercises that translate very well into biking and running in particular. And he said, you know, you, he didn't say you're weak, but he said you could be much, much stronger. At your level, you should be. At the back end of a – you can get away with it in Olympic distance and even 70.3 racing. But, you know, after six, seven hours, when your quads are starting to really break down in that marathon, you need you need your core. Um, so we got in the gym and he said that there's things you can work on. And for me, that wasn't bad news. I didn't feel like I was getting criticised. That was good news. Oh, there's something I can work on to be better. And that's what my manager said. I was able to do that in my career, just not not take things personally if it was from respected people and um, just, yeah, just take it under sort of advisement and just get on with it and, and try and implement it somehow. So, um, yeah. You win it in 08, dream come true. You come back in 09, you're like, oh, what was I so worried about? I did it again. And then 2010 then, people started to catch on to uh, Craig's plan in Kona, which is like, dude, he's going to swim in the front pack. He's going to come off the bike near the front and he's going to run to the front, right? So I think it was, was it Maka who, you know, potentially orchestrated an attack plan against you on the bike? He has a stellar run, but I think a lot of the guys, and I've tried to push that all year, even last year, um, have realized he does have that Achilles heel, and it, which is the bike, and um, they need to exploit that. People are obviously going at a pace that I don't think I can sustain for the whole 112 miles. Then I have to make a decision. Do I roll the dice and go with them? And chances are you could probably ride the ride with them, but you're going to pay for it somewhere. And, and you know, these are the decisions that you need to make. And the reason people end up walking or slowing down is not because they're not good runners. It's because they've spent too much energy on the bike, pure and simple. And he's like, let's just leave them in the dust. Let's push the bike hard. We know Craig's going to ride kind of soft on the bike. That's his weakness. Let's exploit it. Did you know about that plan ahead of time or did you find mm, it after yeah. the race? No, they talked about it for months leading up and I, I heard about it. And I think that was part of their plan. They wanted me to to know. and They wanted you to the end know? Of, yeah, I think so. They, they wanted me to know that they were all working against me. It was me against the field. And I, I sort of presumed that that was the case anyway. I mean, nobody wants the same person to win over and over. And I, th I think Maka just was very calculated in the way he sort of pitched that idea to everyone. And I, I know on the bike, it felt like, yeah, they were all working against me. They, they would work together and get little groups and go up the road and I would close a gap down and then somebody else would go. And it is what it is. I think at, at some point, I probably still could have executed better on the bike in 2010. I held back a little when maybe I should have shut one of the gaps that, that, that opened up and it did open up at about a hundred K at Harvey. And then what happened was when the gap opened and I think there was a group of eight and a group of 10, I was in the group of 10 and that group of 10 just left me on the front the whole way back into town. And I was happy to work, but generally what happens is you share the pacemaking um, and we were getting splits 
to the group in front and we were hearing that they were sharing the pacemaking and really working hard. And I just think everyone thought that I was a defending champ. So I was worried about the gap getting out, but I was riding as hard as I could. But I sat on the front of that group for 60 or 70 K and really needed someone else to, to come around and do take up the pacemaking a little bit, like we heard was happening in the front group. And in the end, the, the gap went up to eight minutes and I, I ran a good marathon that year. I still ran a 241. Only, it was only eight minute gap off the bike. Yeah. 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 And I, I ran up into fourth. I almost got third. Um, and I had the quickest, I think I had the quickest run of the day or one of the quickest runs, 241, but it got me from from like 12th up into 4th. And yeah, it wasn't a terrible race. And, and I actually averaged one of my highest outputs on the bike ever. Um, but that was one of the learnings from that race that maybe I need to change things up tactically a little bit, but also I need to overhaul equipment because prior to that, there was a lot of talk about aerodynamics and bike position, but it wasn't like it is now. Like you, you, Ted, you were out in Kona, you see all the great bikes and the great positions and the top athletes, they spend all year working on that and fine tuning it. Well, 10 or 12 years ago, we sort of knew about it. It was something that was talked about. It was in the media, but people didn't have access to the wind tunnels like they do now. There wasn't a lot of, there was bike position, but not as much experience and knowledge around well how do we fine tune a great comfortable position and mesh it with great aerodynamics so people were experimenting going very low in the front end or coming up at the front end and it's the first year that a lot of the big bike brands didn't conform to uci rules and just made you know specific time trial bikes um with the big fat tubing the bladed tubing um this is this more is, aero this is 2010 you're talking about yeah, I, 09 it sort of started, okay, but 2010 right, right. most most people were really on a on a specific TT bike. Got you. Yeah, you, yeah. yours yours was just a, uh, an Orbea, wasn't it in 2010? Yeah, it wasn't a time trial bike. So so that was so post 2010 in that race, that was one of the things that we had to look at. And and I'd re-signed with Orbea at the start of that year, and part of that renegotiation was they were they were developing a new TT bike because. I was seeing all this wind tunnel data um, with the Trek and the Specialized and the Cervelo. And Obey said, yeah, we're on it. We know our bikes. So Obey had promised that that's what we would do. In 2010, they were meant to have a prototype. It didn't come. In 2011, they said to me, we're delayed by 18 months or two years. And I just said, no, that's not good enough. I had to ride a different bike. And you rode, there, the, bike, there was a you rode little... the bike behind you. Yeah, well, actually, at the 70.3 Worlds, I rode a Cervelo first, the P4. Hmm. Um, and so I broke my Orbea contract. Actually, they broke the contract first. And then I just said, well, I'm not riding this bike. It's it's slow because we'd been in the wind tunnel. And they said, well, you're under contract. And I said, yes, yeah, so my contract also says that you would be delivering a bike that tests in the wind tunnel on par with everything else. Um, I'd taken much less money to re-sign with Orbea and really – the only thing that was important to me was that performance clause in the contract, yeah. which they didn't meet. So I went and bought another bike, a Cervelo P4, rode it at 70.3 worlds and won, won in Vegas. I won my, sev my second 70.3 world title and had an amazing, I had the second quickest bike split, I think. Only Chris Lieto um, rode quicker. I think he had two minutes on me off the bike. I was second or third off the bike was in the lead by six or seven kilometers in the run and I won the race by three or four minutes and then, and changed to the, the, the bike behind. Yeah. So, and I only got on that 10 days was it? No, sorry. 16 days before Kona. I got on oh, that bike. Whoa. That's yeah. a story. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. So there's... I, I, dude, I remember watching that 2011 uh, race and I thought, what happened? Like, how did he become a B? Didn't you have the fastest bike split of the day or like second, second, second yeah. yeah. Who, 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 well, the, who rode faster? Chris on Liotta. Chris, oh, Chris well, Liotta. Okay. But yeah. you went from being like, not back of the pack cyclist by any means, but like mid pack cyclist to front of the pack cyclist, just like that. And it, yeah. feels, it well, felt and like to me, it felt like to me, it was almost revenge at 2010 for those guys to kind of taking you out on the bike. Well, the irony, the irony is that a good friend of mine in transition in 2011 came up to me and said, oh, they're all planning to do the same thing again. That's the talk. They're just going to attack you on the bike again. They, he told you in the swim transition? 
one one a friend of mine, yeah, who was also one of my best my main competitors, but it was a guy who was a good friend as how well. Do you, how do you talk in how do you talk in T one? Well, it was it was in it was before the gun went off. We were setting our bikes up. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah, we we just racking like we'd racked our bikes the day before. We're pumping our tires up, getting the bikes set up, and he just came over to me. Raynaud Tissing from South Africa, actually. But he just came up to me on race morning as we were about to walk down to the swim start and said they're planning on doing the same thing. And yeah, I said, I, I presume they were, you know. To your point, I, I, got, I had the second quickest bike split that day in Kona. At the time, I think it was the fourth or fifth quickest split in the history of the race back in. Did you know that going into the race? You said this race, I'm going to leave my mark on the bike? No, I just, I had a, I knew I had better equipment. So I was much more confident because I had now done the wind tunnel testing. So I knew what disadvantage I'd been at the year before. Not only a new bike, I had, I, I raced in an aero helmet for the first time in Kona. I had a race suit that fitted me. It wasn't flapping around. And so I'd maximized a lot of the other things as well. And you cleaned um, up, you cleaned up your bike, um, cleaned up your, you used to have like bottles and everything, right? Cleaned up all of that. Yeah. And, and that were things that with Orbeer, I was meant to be going in the wind tunnel every year to test and we never did it. Um, and I finally in 2011, just went in myself, organized to go in, took a few different bikes in the wind tunnel, chain, played around with all those different bottle positions, different helmets and saw the difference. Mm. Um, so I went, so yeah, I was confident in 2011 that not only will I be able to withstand any attacks that I can actually dictate some of the pace on the bike myself. And that was my plan. So there was a few things different in 2011. I'd done a lot more work in the gym. So I felt I was stronger. I was getting older. So I had to do that. I had better equipment and I had a different mindset that I'm just not going to wait for attacks. When the first attack goes on the bike, I'm going with it. And the first attack came at the airport on the way out of town. So like 15 miles into it, it was Chris Liato and I, he got about 70 or 80 meters up the road and I just said, I'm going. So I just, I sat about 50 meters behind Chris for probably an hour. Um, and we felt comfortable, just was riding just to you my two. power. Just you two? Well, by the time I looked back, there was two more. Um, Luke McKenzie and Marino Van Hunaka had come, yeah. had come with me. Um, and behind them, I couldn't see anyone else. And by the time we got to Harvey, we had four minutes. Um, mm. And and at Harvey's kind of where the group sort of came, the four of us, like the whole way up, we were just sort of on our own. Um, and I felt comfortable. I was riding to power. Um, was just trying to hold around four watts per kilo comfortably, felt comfortable. Turned at Harvey and saw we had this huge lead um, on the group of Andy Rayler um, and all the other contenders. Uh, so, yeah. Um, Ended up riding a 4.23 that year. And, and even at 140K into the bike, Liado threw in a little attack and I went with him and I felt so comfortable. And we sort of opened up a gap on Marino and Luke. But I thought, I, I don't need to. I thought Marino's the danger because Marino had run a 2.40 marathon that year and he'd done it. He'd broke, he'd, he'd set the Ironman world record that year at um, seven hours, uh, seven hours, 40 minutes. I think it was in Austria. And he ran a 239 marathon. So I thought, oh, okay, he's the danger for me this year. Um, and also Andy Raylard, who was back in back in the bunch four or five minutes back, he'd done a 730. I think he'd done a 730. Yes, yeah. So he'd broken the record as well. Yeah. Uh, so there were two records, of course. You've got, you've got the fastest time, which I think Andy Raylard did the fastest time in Roth. Yeah. Marino's Marino's time was in, a, in an Ironman race. So they called it the Ironman world record. And, that was a minute or two slower. Either way, they were both super quick times. And I had the most respect for both of those guys. And I thought, well, they're the two guys who are in form this year. Um, they're the two major contenders in Kona. So when Liado took off on the bike, I sort of went with him. And I thought, no, I really need to just, I need to be able to run a really good marathon today because Marino's in 240 shape. So I just, I sort of drifted between Chris and those two for a while. And then by the time we got to the four seasons, Luke and Marino had ridden back up to me and that was, that's with about 15 miles to go at that point or 20 miles to go. And yeah, I felt good. Hopped off the bike, rode a 423, second quickest bike split of the day. And I think at that point was the fifth or sixth quickest split in the history of the race. So, um, and felt good. Then ran a 244 marathon 
Um, yeah, ended up having a six or seven minute lead deep in the marathon. I cramped up a little bit though, so it wasn't without its challenges that day. And you know, you always get some, it, there's always heat and some win there. It's just when you hear people say, oh, it's an easy year in Kona. I think what, and when I used to say that, I mean, it's an easy, easier year relative to some other years. Right. Um, uh, it's always tough there. It's a hard course, hard competitors. You said you got off the bike, was it four minutes behind Lieto? No, that year I was, I think, two and a half or three. Yeah. Okay, so, so, uh, yeah, so you passed Lieto relatively quickly then. Yeah. On a lead drive, yeah, yeah, a lead drive. I passed him. Yeah, I think nine k into it, nine, nine kilometers K. into it. Right. Yeah. And then, and then you just held the lead for the rest. And was that the year you set the course record? Yeah, eight oh three. Yep. So I was on pace to break eight hours for a lot of it, and I wasn't even thinking about that to be honest. I just really wanted to win the race. Um, for me, every year is different. There, it's hard to compare year to year. Um, you know, there's been some course changes over the years and the conditions are always different. Even if the wind blows from slightly different direction, it changes the nature and the sort of the character of that course. Um, so, yeah, I really just wanted to win. And I started cramping about 35K into the marathon. So the last 7K were quite tough. Where were the had cramps? To... I was getting them in the quads, in my adductors, and then in the oh, hamstrings I think as I well. I remember that. Yeah, you stopped even mm. for a second. And you at near the end, you yeah. remember you grabbing your hamstrings a bit. I was like, oh, no, is it going to blow up? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I stopped a few times actually. Um, yeah, had to walk walk a couple of aid stations and and then, yeah, again that that just shows you in that race that because at in the energy lab I ran through my special needs and I had salt tablets, but I had a seven or eight minute lead and I was feeling good and I thought, oh, I don't really need to stop for my special needs, but I should have. I should have just slowed down for that three or four seconds to grab special needs and just carried the salt tablets, but I didn't. And you know, it's funny. Because it was about a one or two K past special needs that I started getting the, oh, I started thinking, oh, I'm, st- I'm going to cramp here in a minute. I could feel it coming on. And so, you know, you've never, you've always got to be just thinking and planning. And uh, I think on top of your game mentally in that race, because uh, things can happen quickly. So, so you're, you're, you got the lead, you're about to set a course, well, you're on, you're on track to set a course record, but you dialed it back due to cramping, right? When you when you're running down Elite you Drive for the finish line, this is the year I believe you did the the hop, right? Yeah, well I the cramps got pretty bad and I was just sort of battling that and I thought, you know, I've only I've just got to get back into town and I'll be fine. And I got down Polani, which I think that's the footage where I stopped and I bent over. That was the last aid station I was at. I was still cramping and Got on a lead drive and I realized I heard Mike, I could hear Mike Riley on the microphone then saying, I think he can still break the record. So I put on a little bit of speed, whatever I could muster. And I ended up breaking the record by 12 seconds. Um, But as I ran up, I saw Greg Welsh behind the finish. And that's the little jump was um, a little nod of the cap to Greg because Greg, when he won the race in 94, he did the jump. And he was also one of the reasons I got into the sport. So um, but I cramped, I, I cramped as I was about to jump. <laughs> yeah, it was a funny I, I, jump, man. It was, it wasn't as good a jump as his jump. <laughs> oh, I get the story behind that now. There we go. That makes sense. You used to say that, uh, although a triathlon is you're mixing the swim bike and running together, you said that to become a better swimmer, you had to train with great swimmers to become a better cyclist. You had to train with the best cyclists and then to become the best runner, you had to train with runners. Uh, do you still believe in that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of benefit to doing that. Obviously, when you're structuring a, a training plan, you have to take into a fact uh, in, in, into account that you know when you turn up at a at a track session for running, for argument's sake, you might have ridden earlier in the morning, so there's that fatigue, and uh, that's a good thing though because we're, we're you know in triathlon we run fatigue, so I, I I used to factor that into my training as well, and often do a lot of my key run sessions after bike sessions, but what I used to like about training with the the single discipline athletes was technically just looking at what they did, how they structured their sessions. You know, you can learn from the best people and then you have to take it and apply it to what you're doing and, and the demands and what's specific to what you're doing. But yeah, I used to love doing track sessions or long runs with runners and just look at their technique and look what all the good runners had in common was a really stable, strong core and a relaxed arm carriage and relaxed breathing, even under pressure. 
as the tempo and the speed went up. And you look at the best runners now, look at Kip Chogi, how he looks so relaxed. And I think as triathletes, we can learn and take a lot from that and then apply it to what we need to do. Did you ever pretend you were a runner, someone else when you were running in Kona? Never anyone in particular, but I always visualized that I was just really light. And even when I was completely fatigued and probably hitting the ground heavy, I would just imagine I'm just tapping the ground lightly. I'm running on clouds. I'm really light. I'm effortless. Mm. You know, I'm really strong through the core. My my turnover is really nice. Yeah, I, I had mental cues in all the disciplines that, you know, in the swim, long and lovely, length of stroke. That was one of my cues. On the bike, no upper body movement. Try and lock that out in cadence, nutrition. I had different cues and different things that, you know, you would you were just checking the boxes, doing a systems check all day long in the run. Um, um, relaxed arm carriage, breathing, relaxed breathing, leg turnover. I was just constantly checking the boxes. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think help, having those cues mentally helps you throughout the day. So yeah, those were the things I used to think about. But sometimes I would on do, in track sessions think that I was Seb Co or um, you know any of those great runners. Cool, man. Well, final question. La- what's the best music you like to listen to when you're when you're training? Yeah, something up tempo for sure. ACDC. Interesting story. I went to the same high school as Angus and Malcolm Young. So 20 years after them, but um, Angus Young used to wear our school uniform on stage when he was on stage in concerts. So um, I used to like a little bit of ACDC, any sort of 80s rock, even 80s pop, to be honest. That was my era growing up. So My next workout, I play 80s rock and 80s pop. I'll be hearing what you listen to when you train. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When I would do the longer runs, it would I would mix it up. I'd like a lot of just good songs that uh, I had good memories around and would, would sort of stir up nice emotions to help me relax and feel good. Cause I think mentally when you feel good, that translates into, you know, how you acted out athletically. And then also at the end of long runs, up tempo songs, so I could kick it home and bring it home strong. Well, dude, uh, Congrats again on your, on your, on your amazing success. I could ask you a hundred more questions, but maybe another time if people want to either get into triathlon or take their triathlon or even just their fitness, cardiovascular fitness to the next level, uh, would, would San Zigo be potentially the right uh, next step for them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, check us out. I mean, there's a lot of great coaching options out there and I think a lot of it comes down to expertise and knowledge and, and who you've got in the team, but also personality and getting a, building a nice rapport with people who you work with as well. So, um, yeah, check us out, sanzigo.co. We've got um, a great little online community there with, with some really great coaches and experts, nutrition experts, aerodynamics experts. With um, Actually, one of the guys who led out the swim I think he was third or fourth out of the water in Kona a couple of weekends ago. He's our swim expert, Jesper Svensson from Sweden. He used to be on the Swedish junior national swim team. So that was his background. So he he does swim analysis. You can film your swim stroke and he'll give you tips on, Amazing. on that. And yeah, we, we got a nice little team we've assembled. So yeah, check us out. And um, we've also got uh, great coaches who do one offer one-to-one coaching as well. So Sweet, man sanzigo.co or .com? .co. .co? Cool. Thanks, Ted. Have a good day, man. Appreciate your time.